Thank you all. Yeah, I've, I've been laughing at all these tough Canadians. It's snow. We've already had snow. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for your interest. Thank you for coming through the snow to hear me blab on about Verity, which is kind of what I do. I mean, I, I talk about Wagner and I love Wagner's music and I'm very interested in these are the two pillars and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about Wagner sometime in the near future. But deep down, if I had to just sort of sum up what am I about in one word, it would be Verdi. This is, this is the center of everything. Everything comes out of, from there. Um, can I shut this door here? Is that OK? Because I've, I've got like kids about to come in and steal the show from me here. Um, I'm, I'm not so great that uh, I can trust sharing the stage with kids. Also, um, yeah, I do work at the Metropolitan and um, don't tell my boss I'm here because he will be mad that I've taken opera lovers away from the Met Live in HD transmission today, which really you kind of should be at also. So, no, really. Go to the Encore, go, and I'm honestly, and I'm not shilling for the Met here, well I am, but I, I, I would anyway, because it, you know, sometimes there's a new opera and you kind of have to talk to someone and say, okay, why am I supposed to like this? Those, there are those. This one, I saw it in Quebec City, I have no problem saying it's great. And so just go. Make sure you go to the Encore and really do that so when I get back I can tell my boss, no, they all promise they're going to the Encore um, because he will ask. Uh, okay, but here today we're here to talk about Verdi. And first I want to talk about why and then tell you a little bit about what we're going to do about this. Um, the question is why love Verdi and what can you get out of a performance of a ver a live performance of a Verdi opera that is unique, which then becomes what's opera about? Why do we like it? We've all faced that. If you've ever been to the opera and you tell someone who's not someone else who's in this room right now that you're going to the opera, you always get that kind of look like, oh. <laughs> You know, and it's funny because I always thought that was just in the States, but apparently that's in Canada too. There's this idea of like, well, that's admirable of you and very bold and um, a little subversive and uh, not very trustworthy. You know, I mean, there is this, this fact, and I have this really neat visual talk about uh, Verdi in movies and how whenever you see a gangster, there'll be some Verdi playing in the background. <laughs> or, you know, the evil supervillain who's petting his cat and about to take over the world, and you hear Verdi in the background. And that's not just random. There is something disturbing and, I would say, threatening to some people about this art form. And I think we're going to talk a little... Actually, that is what we're going to talk about here. Um, and just so you know, I'm not doing anything visual because what I want to do is read it with our ears. I want to listen first. And then there's plenty of talk about productions these days. And it's all very interesting and I encourage it and I, I instigate a lot of it. Um, I don't know if you heard, we had the uh, premiere of the new production of Umbalo in Mascara the night before last at the Met. It was very late and it was absolutely terrific and then it was a big hoo-ha and you know the production team came out and for the men it was pretty good because I'd say it was about 60 percent booze and 40 percent applause which is genuinely controversial as opposed to just everybody booing which is always kind of a rough moment on the radio uh, like oh wow hmm, how about that oh wow um, but uh, why did I bring that up well, Robbie, oh, productions, right. Because there's a lot to talk about with that, and that's interesting. Why, why people like to boo directors, why directors like to get booed, apparently. Um, although, again, let me tell you, your Canadian, Robert Lepage, did not get booed at The Tempest. It was almost a little disappointing. Um, and, but anyway, here we're, today we're going to hear the story. 
Uh, and the story is this. When Verdi died, the poet D'Annunzio, who's this whole sort of story of his own, uh, gave an epitaph that just sounds kind of nice uh, the first time you hear it, but then when you think about it, it's interesting. He said, uh, Verdi sang and wept for all. And this is actually pretty insightful because Verdi's art covers all of humanity. He is, I cannot think of an artist who is more humane than Verdi. And by that, that's what we're going to look at what I mean. I don't mean what people often talk about. We heard um, the chorus Va Pensiero in our little greatest hits we were playing before. And we always, people always talk about Verdi as, as this wonderful man who was a great patriot of his country, certainly was, great patriot, um, very involved in the movement to create a nation of Italy. Of course, there are probably some Austrians who might have seen it another way, but Verdi, it's interesting, there are a lot of Verdi operas where there's no bad guy. Now that's not typical in an Italian opera. There are some where there are some really good bad guys who actually twist their mustache, but there are others, and there are always baritones, but there are others where there is no bad guy, which I think tells us a lot. There was a letter he wrote during the Italian unification movement, and I know I read it and I quoted it, but I was trying to find where it was for the, to cite the reference, and I couldn't, but it's there, uh, where he said, uh, may the Austrians, the army, return to their home and find the skies of their homeland as beautiful as we find ours. In other words, please leave. It's nothing against you. Sorry we have to shoot at you. you have a very sort of Gandhi-esque kind of way. But we, we can exaggerate. The fact that he had that quality in him is not necessarily what we get out of his art. Um, we tend to, I think, exaggerate Verdi's niceness because, as I mentioned, he's always in opposition to Wagner, and they're sort of the good cop, bad cop of opera. You know, Wagner is definitely the bad cop. This is the bad guy. He was a very bad person, as a person. That doesn't mean that Verdi, it's Jekyll and Hyde, that doesn't mean that Verdi was all good. What is good, and this is important because it's also the bicentennial year for of Wagner's birth. Interestingly, that they were both born in the same year. Um, Verdi had his faults, plenty of them, ask his wife, whole other story. Uh, the humanity of Verdi is in his art and what it says about each of us. That's what we're going to talk about. There's no greater storyteller in history than Verdi. I just said that. There is no greater storyteller that includes Shakespeare. He is the equal of Shakespeare as a storyteller. I mean, maybe there is, but I haven't found a greater one yet. Sophocles, whoever else you want to come up with. But Verdi uses music primarily to tell his stories. Shakespeare used words primarily to tell his. He also used music, Shakespeare. Um, the literal sense, you know, the lady sings in Welsh, and off you come and strum some music. But there's also the music in the words of Shakespeare. There are people, Verdi and his librettist Boito were among them. They did not know English. They read Shakespeare in French, but they heard it in English and responded to the music of it. Um, Verdi also uses words in his art, but he uses it in that way he would have heard Shakespeare. He uses the musicality within the words first before the literal meaning. Now this is very, whoa, very hard for us in English speaking countries to fathom, especially those of us in Protestant cultures. I'm not Protestant, but I'm an American. It's a Protestant culture where we tend to have the same Canada, where we, uh, this part of Canada, where we tend to have this, the primacy of the word. What does the word mean? And I think this is not an esoteric discussion. This, when those of us who are trying to do marketing with the arts and this sort of thing are talking to people about opera and getting that look back. And you, you know the things they always say, right? The things they always say about opera, like, oh, the stories, they're so silly. 
It's like, really? What did you watch on TV last night? 24, Alien, really? And you're laughing at, at, because it's not the stories. That's what people say again because there's something that makes them uncomfortable. And then they say, well, I can't understand the words. And you have to realize that not, most people in the world don't speak Italian. Very few people speak Italian. It's one of the reasons I loved teaching Italian because the only reason anyone would ever sign up for an Italian class is because they loved it. You're not going to make any money speaking Italian. It's not a business language. It is for a few people if you're working with Olivetti, but mostly it's not. Um, so you have to love it, and you can love it from the words. There's acoustical meanings to words before, as, in addition to semantic meaning. And we, we kind of know this, those of us who love popular music. What are, what are the words to, what are the lyrics to Get Off of My Cloud? By the Rolling Stones, right? I don't know, I've been listening to that song for 45 years. All I hear is blah, 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 blah. You know, it's Mick Jagger screaming at the top of his lungs. Absolutely incomprehensible. But when he wants you to know what he's saying, he says, hey, you get off of my cloud. And that's what you remember. You understand it. And that's a good way to listen to Italian opera, too. When you need to understand the word, there's about five you need to know. Vendetta, morte. Actually, those are the two you need to know. Um, <laughs> The musicality, the acoustics of the words take primacy over the semantics. So with this in mind, now, really quickly, I mean, maybe Mick Jagger needed to say, blah, 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 before he got to, hey, you, get off of my cloud. Maybe he needed everything that came before to get into the right sort of space to make that chorus so memorable. And maybe it works the same in Verdi. But with this in mind, it's a little stupid to talk about the silliness of Verdi's plots and the librettos. Verdi, Verdi picked great librettos, great. What they aren't is good synopses. When I have to get on the radio and tell the story in one minute of what's going to happen, that's when it's funny. As any of you know who have heard Anna Russell talking about Wagner, and all she does in the ring is tell the story. That, as she says, I'm not making this up, you know. But if you trim it down to 17 minutes as opposed to 17 hours, it's hilarious. And some of Verdi's operas are really hilarious when you do them that way. But I wish instead of reading the synopses, we could hear the synopses a little bit more. And that's what we're going to do. And that's a heck of an introduction. So uh, what I want you to do is trust your audio guts. The better the opera is, the more you can believe what you just heard. Gee, they sound happy. Gee, something seems wrong there. Uh, this is, I think, what makes a great opera. And kids can do this. Kids do this whether you want to or not. So that's one of the reasons kids or people who know absolutely nothing about music, and actually what I should say is absolutely nothing about what they think they're supposed to know about music, are in certain ways at advantages from those of us who know something, because you just hear something. There are natural sounds. A baby, baby chicks, I'm told, like chirp up when they're being fed or about to be fed and they're happy, and chirp down when there's something wrong. I don't know, I've never lived around chickens, but I believe that. I believe there are certain sounds that can be manipulated, and Verdi knew those sounds better than anybody and that includes the sounds made by the words, and that's how we want to listen. Now, here come audio examples. Now that I'm going to play them, let me check to see. Yeah, OK, fine. Um, Kevin, can we hear number one a little bit? I'm not going to tell you what it is. You may know. Next, it'll be about a minute from the end, right? But hold off on that for one second. Okay, so, wow, all right, well, what's there? Not much. I mean, that's a weird example to start with, right? Uh, what can you say you just heard there? And if you know what it is, be quiet. 
or, or, or pretend you don't. But just from the audio evidence, what did you hear? Just throw some stuff out because I can barely see you, so don't raise your hands. A plea. A plea. A plea. All right. Hold that thought. More. Lament. Lament. Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Wow, you guys hear amazing stuff. How about, we'll get back to that because that's all in there. How about on a much more concrete level, we have, what kind of voice do we have? Baritone. Uh, and is he singing a l up and down the scale or keeping kind of close? What it is, we have, I'm, I'm trying to, well, that's all right, I don't have a chalkboard here. <laughs> I was going to the chalkboard and then I realized there isn't one. Um, it, it, it's flat, not flat in the musical sense, but there's a flatness to the, the main theme there. It's such a simple theme. It's such a simple theme that only one person in history could have written it. And it, therefore, it does have a certain, there's a sense of sadness in it, um, loss maybe. What it is, is Rigoletto, it happens to be Rigoletto, we're starting with Rigoletto, uh, Rigoletto. Get a little background in a moment, but let me do this without background. In this case, this is the character of Rigoletto, the father, and Verdi and Baritones go together really well. Um, Verdi wrote amazingly well for the baritone voice, and by that, again, I'm not a musician. I don't care if he wrote well this way or that way. I mean, he wrote well, meaning he gave the baritone things to do that resonate really, really powerfully in me um, and in you. Not because I'm a baritone, I'm not, I'm a bass. We resent all the great Arias Verdi wrote for baritone. Um, but we have also uh, a lot of the character you can Monday morning quarterback into what we just heard. The story of Rigoletto, well, first of all, the opera itself, very quickly, is one of the miracles of the theater. And it is a miracle in that it was a hit on its opening night. It was actually a hit before its opening night. The word was out during rehearsal that that Verdi nailed it this time. You're going to want to be there. And to the point where, of course, Verdi held the most famous tune that would probably ever be written in history, the most hackneyed tune, uh, La Donna Immobile, uh, held it from the <coughs> cast until the opening night because he knew if anybody heard it, it would be out in the world and it would take away from the impact. So that's one of the reasons that the orchestration is so simple in that. Na, 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 is because the, on the premiere night at La Fenice in Venice, that was the first time the orchestra had seen it. The, the ink was wet. It was the first time the tenor, the tenor was given it on the side, and they said, okay, now go out there, do it, sing it. Imagine, with the tenor. No, wait, we'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> And the story goes, it's well, it's well attested to uh, in many sources that that's in Act 4, well, Act 3, scene, whatever, it's toward the end of the opera. Um, and there's about 15 minutes left to the opera after La Donna Immobile. And as people were leaving the theater, the little bands, like, you know, the, the guy with the fiddle and whatever in the Piazza San Marco were playing it which means that somebody was sitting in the theater and went, oh my God, this is great, and ran to the cafe and said, it goes like this, guys, da, 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 da. And they were playing it, and if you've ever been to Venice, you know they've been massacring it ever since in those cafes. And that's the, that's the nature of Rigoletto. It has been, critics respect it, musicians love it, and audiences like it. Those works don't grow on trees, I'm here to tell you. Nobody, even people who sneer at Verdi and let me know who they are, uh, really dares to say anything about Rigoletto. And let me show you a little bit of why. Can we go to that next, uh, Kevin, a minute before the end, about?
okay, let's, I could listen to that all day on a repeat, but okay, now we have a duet, a father-daughter duet for which Verdi is famous, a baritone soprano duet, and in the story, in the libretto, the story is very interesting. Rigoletto, of course, is this really remarkable character. He's just awful. He's just a terrible, terrible, terrible person. He's, uh, if you know this, bear with, but he's, I'll make it short, um, the court jester at the most depraved, immoral court in Renaissance Italy, and that's saying something. I mean, you know, what you do for fun is sort of abduct people, rape women, kill people, you know, Wednesday night is what they'd call it at the court of the Duke of Mantua, uh, who you're getting a friend of mine, David Pomeroy, as the Duke of Mantua, who's perfect for that role of the, the depraved Duke. Uh, you tell him I said so. But, um, <laughs> and this court jester eggs everybody on and, and makes it worse. However, he has the one thing that's good in his life, the one thing, and that's his daughter. Nobody knows, well, they find out, but nobody knows that he's got a daughter and he wants to keep it that way because he does not have a high opinion of the world, so he keeps her secluded, really secluded. Eventually, it suffocates, get it, metaphor, her to death. Well, oops, I just gave away the ending. I hope you're not one of those people who <laughs> hates that. But, um, you know, it's... A romantic opera, she's going to die, probably, and she does. Uh, but that's why it's a metaphor, because you cannot do that. Do you know anyone who is a absolute rotten person at work and some sort of raider who takes over companies and fires everybody and drains them dry, but says, but at home, I'm a great family man, you know, this sort of thing. And this says, this shows us why you cannot do that, why it doesn't work. Now, what sets this up at the beginning here, this is uh, Rigoletto with his daughter, who he only sees occasionally, and it's, there's a sadness in their whole relationship, in her whole being, and he's also trying to be steady, like, stay calm, you know, uh, that calming voice that sounds so good in the baritone range of, you know, just stay here, you don't want to go out in the world, trust me, trust me, I'm your father. I really get a lot of that in that line, in that flat, in the right way line. Trust me, trust me, I'm your father. Then when she comes in, she sings the same line, but then they come in together, and he's taking that line, and she was doing the desk and the decoration. Dun, 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 dun. And it's the most amazing thing, and it may or may not be the most amazing music. I don't know. I'm not a musician. But it clearly says, I mean, she is, we get the idea, she's the only decoration in his lamentable life. She's the, only, she's the beauty in his flat, in the flatness of his life. It gets better, though, because there's, that's from his point of view, what is she to him? Well, you could see it written in the music, whether or not you read music. He's here and she's here. She's the decoration. But from her point of view, she's like the ivy around the tree. Or wait, am I, I don't know enough about botany. Is that the right metaphor? She, uh, she cannot get away from him. Her notes, she always comes back to where he is musically. Dun, 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 dun. She's completely, her whole being is literally wound around her father. He's the only man she has ever met. Well, she meets another one, and it's a tenor, and all hell breaks loose. And let's hear all hell breaking loose. In example number three, please, Kevin.
fade out or drop out. Um, that is a tenor doing what tenors do, which is being, to put it nicely, in love, but he's not in love. Um, the, the line, and you're going to think I'm just saying this to be lurid, and I'm really saying it for other reasons also. Um, the, the overall movement of his line is this upward direction. He's, he's always, and this is true in, throughout Rigoletto, he goes up, and this is Italian opera code telling us what it sounds like. And you think, again, I'm, I might be being goofy, but they heard it that way. In Carmen, when Carmen sings, L'amour est en... What the words? I was so rebelled. L'amour est en... This chromatic, which is the fancy way of saying all the notes down, you know, all the black ones too. Um, they heard a woman lying back and inviting a man onto her. They heard it in Samson and Delilah too, when she sang um, uh, her line. I, I can't even remember the words right now, but Delilah, they heard these things and they spoke about them. They called them obscene. Uh, glad I came up with that one. Um, and it was decried in the press as an obscenity. They, we can only see pornography. We can only decry, like, you can't have that on television, they're naked. They heard it in the 19th century. These are our repressed Victorian antecedents who were not repressed. They were much more sensitive to these things than we are. We are desensitized, having been buffeted around by so much of it. They, they knew what they were hearing. They trusted their guts, their audio guts. And they heard in that moment, oh, well, the tenor's trying to put the moves on her, obviously. And also, with Verdi, who knew the human voice, I keep throwing these extravagant lines out there, but I'll back them up, better than anyone who's ever lived. He also knew there's this place in the tenor voice, it's usually around F, E, F sharp, uh, the passaggio, that where the, you just get naturally tight before you go up into the head voice. Where, and you, you know those, those, I mean those high notes where like, uh-oh, he's going to get it. And you know, he plants his feet and ha, and there he goes onto the high note. The, the way to that high note, the passaggio, through it, is a very tricky place. It sounds inherently emotional. You can lose everything right there. It's very easy. Try it at, at home. If you're a baritone, it's a little lower. But if you know what you're doing, dramatically, you put it in the right place. And where he sounds like he's going to burst a blood vessel right at the end, toward the, toward the end there, and then he gets to the climactic place. So we, we have this sort of audio vision of a tenor being aroused, and that's what tenors do. I mean, there's, and I, I'm not being lured there, there are certain, voices have certain qualities, I'm gonna talk about that for a minute too, that represent things. And the old joke about, you know, tenors are stupid. Some tenors are stupid, some everyone's stupid, but you know, Placido Domingo is one of the smartest people I've ever talked to, and he's a tenor. So, uh, actually, so is Matthew Polanzani. So, it isn't that simple. It means that the tenor voice best represents things that are about action, not about intellect. That when it's time to go to war, to go to arms, and we'll hear an example, you get the tenor to say that, because that's what it sounds like. When it's time to, I've got to make love to you right here, right now, you need a tenor. Not because tenors are stupid, but because that urgency and non-intellectual quality of that feeling is best represented by the tenor. You know, the other night also we had um, The Marriage of Figaro, which is, you know, also as good as anything ever. Um, and there's this uh, great ensemble at the end of Act Two called The Thinking Music. And the orchestra keeps going like, Dun, 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 dun. And everybody on stage has a secret, and everybody's trying to hide something, and everybody's trying to figure out what the person on the left is up to. 
And they're all going, but wait, you said you were in that room. And then that one says, I was, but then I went to the other room. And the orchestra goes, da, da, da. you can hear them thinking. And there's, by the time they're done, there's six people on stage. It's the most amazing thing. And there's no tenor. <laughs> when you want thinking music, don't have the tenor. And that's not because the tenor is stupid. Again, maybe he is. That's a, so are lots of other people. It's because it doesn't sound like somebody thinking. It sounds like somebody acting. Uh, let's hear a little of example number four, please. So here you have the tenor putting the moves now on the mezzo. Again, his, you look at the music, it's always, you know, he's moving up, he's putting the moves on. And it's a very simple tune. Then we're going to layer the others onto it. This is the famous quartet. And it's one of these moments that you can only do in opera, where you get, in this case, four people, literally at an intersection at the same time, all their fates, listen to the passaggio, and right through there. That little <gasps> Caruso invented that. Now they all do it. Okay, so we know what he's up to. He's not going to war, he's doing that other thing Tanner's doing. <laughs> There's Jilda being sad. If you don't hear sadness, that's the woman we heard before being shown what a cad she's fallen in love with. Here's the dad. Told you so. And we have this other woman, the floozy, who in this case is the mezzo. Mezzos are as bad girls. She's literally all over the place. I mean, you know, that's her. We'll hear her in a moment. Once again, here's the tenor. No, listen, what do I, but what about my needs? <laughs> There's the floozy in there, right? Okay, fade it out, or drop it. That's the quartet, that's the moment that you can hear it in constant, it's, oh my God, what great music. You get it in dramatic context, you cannot get that experience, if you're paying attention, in any other art form. These are four people, We've, they've laid out their destinies, we know what's happening, now let's see what happens when they come into contact with each other, and you see it from above, or from inside, whatever the metaphor is, which is how life actually is. In this way, opera is the only realistic art. You go to a party, and you see, oh, this one's doing that, and that one's doing that, and this one's doing that, and you take in the totality, and, but yet you cannot repeat that. Shakespeare will take thousands and thousands of words to give you that same information that you get in real life. And Verdi can do it in two minutes in the uh, quartet of Rigoletto. And okay, I'm gonna do a few more, a couple more examples just to show you a couple of things real quickly beyond Rigoletto. In Il Trovatore, now, I don't know if you've ever seen Il Trovatore. I always say this is the opera your parents warned you about. <laughs> this, this will really corrupt your morals. I mean, it really will. This is the official crazy one. This is the one with the, a very extravagant story. Of, it's, to me, it's life on the edge, and I love it, because it's, it's not really crazy. It's just up to the point of craziness. Crazy things happen. You know, the gypsy who meant to throw the baby in the fire, but threw her own in by accident. That's out there, I'll admit that. But it's supposed to be out there. And the librettist, Camerano, who is a really smart guy, he wrote the libretto for Lucia di Lammermoor, he knew what he was doing. He kept saying, let, let, let's tone it down. Very said, no, more, crazier. And then, then he said, well, let's have a mad scene for this gypsy. And this is the guy who wrote the libretto for Lucia di Lammermoor. He knew how to write a mad scene. Right? And Verdi said, no, because what's really, really scary is she's not crazy. Uh, 
just a couple quick ones, maybe 10 seconds each. Let's, can we hear five? Where's the rhythm? It's in the wrong place. Let's hear number six. The rhythms in Trovatrata are half the story. There's always, they're always fighting against each other. They're always, there's, it's, it's the world out of whack. A little, a little out of whack, but it keeps going. Um, and then we have, of course, the big tenor moment, which is the big tenor moment, which is not only two arms, but I mean, we've got to go right now because they come in and tell him, your mother's on fire. No, I'm, I'm serious. They just set your mother on fire. So, and everyone always says this is like how Italian romantic opera is abs absurd, but it's so amazing if we're not, if we're going to let go of the idea of real time, because it is not this. Well, why would you stand there and sing an aria when somebody tells you your mother's on fire? Sing an aria twice, and then you repeat it. So Tommy Verdi didn't know what he was doing. He's like, yeah, I know he'd be in a rush here. Let's repeat the aria, right? <laughs> Let's hear a little of, of this and check out the rhythm. It's this weird 5 4. Number 7. Right. We added that note. Okay, cut. There's a high C later. It's terrific. Because um, a high C means, really, I mean it. Um, of course, he is not standing there waving his sword around while they're setting his mother on fire. We should know this now. We've lived through Pirandello. We've lived through Einstein. We know that time is not a continuum. It's, it, it changes speed. This, they knew that before the Industrial Revolution, and we know it after. Handel knew it. Did you ever hear Messiah? And there's the Amen at the end. And it's also the best thing ever. And it's four minutes of Amen. It's not a matter of like, you know, you're used to a church with, okay, they said Amen, let's grab our coats and go to brunch. I thought he'd never shut up. Let's get out of here. It's not that. It's the idea of, you know, let's sit in it. Let's look at everything that can be experienced by this beautiful word, amen, from every angle. And now we'll hear from the tenors. Now we'll hear from the sopranos. Uh, you, four minutes isn't enough time to listen to what Handel had to say about amen. You wish it went on. It's just terrific. Well, let's look at it this way with Di Quella Pira. What, what does that moment of I've got to act feel like? And it feels a lot like Di Quella Pira. It's a little off rhythm. It's a little, uh, it's an uneven meter, like a horse running. There's a lot of that in, uh, in Il Trovatore. Uh, there's a lot of three, four, which we tend to think of as the waltz. But before we all went to you know, proms and had to do a waltz or weddings or whatever, before that, the waltz, well, it's the same reason it's for the waltz. It keeps going. It doesn't stop. And Il Trovatore has this idea of, a train that's out of control. We said in San Francisco cable cars that would lose their brakes sometimes. It would just be like, ring the bell, get out of the way, because we're not stopping until we get to the bay. Here we go. You know, and Il Trovatore is like that, and it's terrific. I could talk more, well, I'll, just very briefly, I'll say one of the interesting things, all the big arias in Il Trovatore are minor keys, except one, which is just gorgeous, which is the most beautiful aria, and it's given to the baritone. And it's in a beautiful G major, and this is where the baritone is telling everyone, I'm going to abduct and rape a nun. That's the pretty area. So right away, we're telling you this is a weird thing going on. Now, let me kind of wrap this up with, oh, I don't want to skip the ball because it's the best. Well, I need to. Okay. Um, with number 11, uh, all right. Let me introduce this. I'm going to play you a little bit from Aida. Now I'm talking about 
I told you about what the tenor, uh, what that voice can portray really well, what it can depict. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the baritone. Verdi uses the baritone in wonderful different ways. He can be the bad guy like in Il Balen, uh, in Il Trattore, who's a very, very bad guy. Or he can be uh, a, a, someone who's conflicted, like Rigoletto, who is bad and good in very extreme ways at the same time. Um, or any num number of the other fathers who are authority figures, but they, they convey sadness and loss uh, the passing of time very well set, uh, like we're going to hear in Aida, Amanastra is one of those. Oh, you're going to hear Aida too, so I'm glad I'm talking about Aida here. Um, these are inherent qualities in the voices. The bass voice uh, is definitely got, has definitely got authority and can be a scary thing, like the priests in Aida are always basically saying, kill everyone. Also in Don Carlo, terrific. Uh, or it could be a, a, a calming voice like the priest in uh, Nabucco, Zaccaria, who helps the people and leads them into that chorus you heard on the way in, Va Pensiero, um, and actually takes them out of it, too. Uh, these are inherent qualities in the voice that Verdi works with, and he works with them really uniquely well in order to tell a story. And then there's the soprano voice. The, the sovereign voice, soprano voice, um, which it is. Ladies, if you have a high voice, you have power. Use it wisely. It is said that opera is the first career that, in which women made independent fortunes, even before acting, which I think tells you something. There is an, a, a physical quality to the soprano voice. You can hear it. You can hear it over an orchestra. You can hear it over a chorus. In the Requiem, uh, 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 at the end, there's the Liberame. And the Requiem is one of Verdi's greatest works. And it is an opera in the sense that it's a drama about what's happening in life, light versus dark, life versus death. Um, and at the end, in the Liberame, and it's all anybody will talk about at the end of a performance of the Requiem. It's, oh, how did she hit the B flat in the Libra? I mean, now I've sung in the chorus, uh, in, in the choir of the, the Requiem. And we worked forever to get as loud as we could. There were 200 of us. And, you know, he kept saying, louder, louder, louder. And we're singing our heads off. And she got up there. And she just went, Libre, da, me, da, me, da, me, da. And that's all you hear. Forget about it. The rest of us could have gone home, right? <laughs> So if you know how to use these voices, you know how to tell a story with them. What I think is going on in the Requiem there is Verdi saying, I don't care about the theology. I don't care about the cosmic, the universe. I care about the one person who's saying, liberame, free me, I need help. I'm talking directly to you, God, and I want an answer. I need it right now. That's the drama, the humane drama, the human drama that Verdi portrayed. The Requiem was instantly, the day it was premiered, indexed as a prohibited for performance in church, quite correctly, as part of the Requiem Mass, because it does not tell you everything's going to be OK. Mozart's Requiem takes you through the fires of hell, but it promises it takes you to a beautiful place. If you've ever heard the Foray Requiem, the Imparadisum at the end, it's like, ah, oh, okay. Well, well uh, right? Not the Verdi Requiem. You're left with a big question mark. He doesn't care what happens to the soul. He cares what happens to the person who's thinking about death. Let's hear from Aida a little of Act Three, and we'll, we'll make that our last, right? Okay. Number 11, please. <laughs> What's going on here? Tenor's trying to get some attention there, did he have? Everybody back out. Here's a soprano.
close up, shuts everybody up, so you're listening. But you could hear her before, and you'll hear her again when all of those come back in. And he told you, wait, never mind what they're all doing, follow her. Drop. Cut it. I mean, we could listen forever. Trust me, that, that goes on, and that keeps happening. You keep... You get lost in this ocean of sound, and then you'll hear her, and then ocean of sound, and then her. Now, what's going on there in that scene is what isn't going on. Um, it, that's the triumphal scene of Aida. This is the most densely packed music Verity ever wrote. There are 20 vocal parts, 20. That includes whole choruses, and I think six soloists. I don't know. I've got it written down somewhere. Soloists, choruses in sections, then there's actually three orchestras, there's the big one in the pit, there's a small one on stage, there's one backstage. The, you, watch the conductor, if he's conducting from a score, and if he isn't, throw money at him or something, but um, he's conducting from the score, it'll be like this. Because <laughs> that's a lot of what's going on. So all this stuff is going on, it's a triumphal scene from Aida, there's just been a war, there are soldiers and priests and citizens and two kings on the stage and a high priest. They're very, very important people. And the, most un the officially most unimportant person on the stage is the slave girl, Aida. She is, everybody else is, according to society, more important than her. And Verdi is telling you, never mind in the Requiem, how about in a situation like this? Well, the Requiem was written after, but you get the idea. Uh, where I'm going to take the most, the lowest person on the stage and make it all about her because she's the soprano and she can cut through all that, cut through two entire nations by implication on the stage. And I am going to say that what she needs right then and there, her emotions, her feelings, her needs in that moment are actually more important than the needs of the state of Egypt, of the state of Ethiopia, which are important in Aida. But this individual's needs are more important. And it's that, that Tolstoy line, of if, if anything becomes more important than the needs of an individual, any atrocity is possible. And that's how Tolstoy put it. And Tolstoy told a story as well as anybody also. But Verdi tells it this way, using the sounds. And, and the words, and the drama, and the setup, but I think it is beyond a good score and beyond a good story. It confers that same dignity on each of you because I am not the bass because I sing bass in the choir. You're not the soprano because you're a high-voiced woman or whatever. We have all of these voices in us. When you're in an emergency, you are the tenor singing de pre la pie. You don't need to have your mother set on fire to feel dun 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 and to respond to that with your voice. When you are telling somebody, when one of your friends has a, an idea that's so brilliant, it's a disaster, and you say, let's think this through. <laughs> you become a baritone, and so on and so forth. So when Aida sings that, you are told viscerally, viscerally, because this works sub-intellectually. You can talk about opera intellectually, but that's not how it works. You know that you count. Whatever's going on, the headlines, the elections, and everything else, you still matter. This is the humanity of Verdi, and you can only get it in that way from this person's art. I highly recommend it. And I hope you will, when you get that look from people, when you say you're going to read a letter or Aida, you say, yeah, I am. You should go too. <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you.